Hello everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild Review, my written and video review series, where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. With this video, I'll be reviewing the DM's Guild Dungeon Compilation Pack, Storm King's Barrows, Tombs and Crypts of the North, uh, for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. It is arranged by uh, Christian Eichhorn, Ich Eichhorn? I apologize profusely for mispronouncing that. And it is, uh, every single dungeon is written by a different person, so I'll be getting into the actual credits for everyone as I go in depth. Um, but I'll just be mentioning Christian's name first, since he was the one that sent me the review copy and, uh, I believe, arranged this entire Dungeoneers pack. As I mentioned, a review copy has been provided for the purpose of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shout out to my platinum patrons, Andrew and Brian, and gold patrons, RPG Papercrafts. Thank you so much for your support. Switch on over to Storm King's Barrows, Tombs and Crypts of the North. There I am. Uh, I One of my favorite things on the DMs Guild website are the dungeon packs, like the one-shots or those, uh, what this is basically is a compilation book of just multiple dungeons designed to slot into any campaign. Now this one is interesting because, as you can tell by the title, it is specifically designed to be used in the Storm King's Thunder campaign uh, by Wizards of the Coast. They don't necessarily obviously have to be used for that, but the way these dungeons are tied together uh, thematically is through to be used during that kind of open world scenario for the most part where the players are searching for the giant relics basically just around the entire northwestern section of uh, Faerun uh, which there's a lot of opportunities to slot in kind of whatever material you want to use and these are just mini dungeons with an emphasis on like crypts type dungeons uh, for the players to get to at that point so most of them are uh, around that levels 5th through 10th with almost all of them actually being around level 8, 9, and 10 specifically. So it's actually, they're a little on the higher end of tier 2, um, which is good if you're looking for, obviously, at that level range, but unfortunately, on the bad part is it doesn't quite have the big, nice level range that a lot of these compilations seem to have, which a lot of them kind of have, you know, here's a level 1 dungeon, here's a level 3 dungeon, here's a level 5 dungeon. This one, it's like, there's two, I believe, that are tier 1, which is like level 3 and 4, and then all the rest of them are like basically 7 through 10 in that specific area. So if you're looking for that specific level range, I think there's a lot to be had here. Uh, also, get ready to strap in because this is, um, I believe, it's at least one of the longest, biggest <laughs> um, DMs Guild products that I've ever reviewed. So this will probably be a fairly long video because I do want to do you know, my usual in-depth analysis, but I can't even do that in-depth because it's just so long and I don't want this video to just go on forever. So I'm kind of been, I'm going to be summarizing all of these uh, ed dungeons, and there are 10 of them included in this adventure, as we can see right here at the table of contents. It's over, I believe it's over 130 pages uh, for this entire product, which is pretty crazy. Uh, I did summarize them, which I will go through uh, quite briefly so you know what dungeons you are getting to. Whoops, I just clicked on that. Let's go back up to the table of contents. Got a little click happy there. Uh, so there are 10 mini dungeons, and as I mentioned, they're they're designed to slot into Storm King's Thunder, but you don't necessarily have to do that. But they just have that theme of either giants or like caves and, and tombs and temples within like the frozen north area, although even then not all of them are there, which I'll get into that. Some of them actually fit the theme really well, and others don't quite fit that theme uh, well at all. But here's the summary. There is an underground temple full of ogres and a furbog worshipping a dark god, designed for levels 1 through 4. I'll go over the titles and everything as I do, but I literally just want to go through them. Just kind of 1 through 10 real quick. Uh, there's an excursion through a dwarven hall to hunt a zorn, designed for level 3. There's a miniature, light-hearted version of the Tomb of Horrors slash Tomb of Annihilation, designed for level 6. A black dragon lair in a mountain, designed for levels 7-ish. There's an odd level range on that one. Uh, a trapped crypt holding an undead wizard designed for level 7 through 8. A monster-filled mine uh, in the midst of a hostile giant takeover designed for levels 8 through 10. A wave of undead attacking a chapel designed for levels 8 through 10. A cavern where an undead barbarian is rising an army of undead forces designed for levels 8 through 12. Probably should have said raising, not rising. 
an expanded Great Worm Caverns with undead, a demon, and a dragon, designed for levels 9 through 11, and a demon-infested crypt, crypt with an evil warlock designed for level 10. That is a lot of content. I actually went through them uh, organized by level, and unfortunately, they don't actually do that here. They're just almost kind of randomly uh, organized. Uh, I wish they were organized by level. That'd be a little easier to read. But that's what. After I went through them, I realized, oh, actually, these are. This is not the level range that I was expecting. This is most of them on the upper end of, of tier two. Um, so it, and the dungeons themselves, they range from, meh to awesome. Like it's, they're not all extremely high quality, but, on an average it's definitely positive like more of them are really good than others there's really only like two or three that I was really like eh, that's lame uh, in terms of not having much there the others there was a few that I thought are really really cool and then you know there's some that I thought are have some cool things about them so you, you just get kind of a, a wide variety which you know is I think what you're gonna end up with with a lot of these uh, dungeon packs is not all of these dungeons are going to necessarily speak to you as the DM or work for your players, but I think you'll find at least a couple in here that you would be able to use, which is probably the overall goal. Just, I think there's a lot of good variety of content in here to be had. Um, so let's go over, and I, I wrote extensive notes for this. It's, you've got me looking back and forth. Uh, for I'm just going to go through kind of one at a time just a brief summary of each one and then kind of give my thoughts on you know if I like it or not um, one thing I do like that this um, compendium does is it lists all of the authors in a nice little blurb up here with uh, the team Let's see, put my mouse my mouse up there where's my mouse oh, oh there it is yeah I do have a mouse up there barely see it um, anyway it, it's the it mentions like a paragraph some of them all a big paragraph uh, for each author and editor, which is really impressive to see, especially on a compilation when you have somebody else writing every single adventure. It lets you kind of get into the shoes of that uh, designer and writer, uh, as well as just give a nice, uh, you know, if you like that person's dungeon, then you can go back to this and look up kind of what else they have done. And most of them have uh, written other adventures in the DM's Guild, which is obviously how they found their way into doing this, you know, compilation pack. So this is a really fantastic uh, edition here. I want to definitely see this in all compilations is nice blurbs about each of the writers, even the artists, the fantasy ground converter, which is amazing. Um, all of that is absolutely fantastic, and I love to see that for sure. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the adventures. And again, this is not the order in which I actually summarize them. This is just kind of a seemingly randomized order. I wish they were put in order of level range, but they are not. So the first one is the odd title of Brave Heroes Only, which is a reference to the fact that there's this uh, kobold that gives your party the quest to essentially go into this mountain and fight a black dragon. And the kobold is kind of in cahoots with the black dragon. And there is a huge amount of time spent on this kobold heap uh, who's like this kind of charlatan fast talking con artist who's trying to like sell the players uh, a bunch of equipment and the equipment has like an ammonia smell and that's supposed to trigger the black dragon because the black dragon was blinded in a previous encounter none of that really worked for me because I don't see my players as ever playing along with this especially because again these are all designed for higher level this is level 7 to 15 which is odd uh, designed for level 7 I guess you could scale it up um, I don't see my players really playing along with that. I see them being very suspicious of the kobold and even intimidating, capturing, or killing this kobold uh, in order to get the right information uh, from her, in which case that kind of skips a lot of the danger of this dungeon and just lets them kind of skip ahead to the black dragon. And there's a little bit where they can like ally with some war tigers, uh, but there's not a lot going on here. It's basically just a black dragon fight at the end, which I believe is not a fully chrome black dragon at that point. Yeah, it's CR7. Uh, so I was, you know, unfortunately this is the adventure this starts off with, and I honestly think this is the least impressive one uh, of the bunch. And I want to get into this, because obviously I'll be scrolling through these. Um, the biggest con I have for this entire compilation, it's a big bummer because I really do like this compilation, is that the maps are the Adventure League style just black lines on like grid, graph, paper, maps that I detest. I absolutely loathe this style of map. And unfortunately, this is like the third thing I've reviewed that uses this map. I did Dragon Heist, which uses these, and then there was another DM's Gilded co uh, dungeon compilation, a much smaller one, that also did this. 
and I just hate it. And I mean, it just doesn't work for me at all as somebody who plays on Roll20. I wish I could see the Fantasy Grounds version. I don't play on Fantasy Grounds at all. I do Roll20, but um, those maps apparently were converted there. I don't know if those maps look better. Perhaps they do, in which case I would like to see them included you know, in the PDF somehow. It does include player maps. You, you get separate handouts for everything. Uh, player, uh, you get th these are obviously the DM uh, version of the maps, but you do get player maps without the numbers, uh, so you could you know use them. But I don't like this style at all, and it's used for every single dungeon. And especially if you're gonna do, if your product is nothing but dungeons, then I need your dungeons to look good. Like the written content is solid in most of these adventures, which is fine. But if all of your stuff is is dungeons, then your dungeon really needs to look good something i can use as a battle map would be preferable i mean it doesn't have to look like you know mike schley professional job at all that's not what i expect at the dm's guild but i do expect some kind of like you know color map with just a few details and things in there even if i look at it and say oh i wouldn't use that but at least give me something other than than this this is just a bummer and i'm not calling out this one adventure or writer in particular this is this is true for every single map in this compilation uses this style map and it you know, my heart just sank when I saw this. I'm like, well, some of these dungeons I love, but as somebody who plays in Roll20, I would have to just immediately remake all of, you know, make these maps from scratch, essentially, which is a bummer. But some of the dungeons are good enough where I would probably do that. Uh, but not that one. That one's not that good. Um, I guess I should call out the writers for each one. I'm going to have all this in my written review as well. Uh, this first one was George Sager. Um, I'll have all the notes and you know, who wrote which dungeon and whatnots, um, but I want to go over each one, mainly the level, the summary, and whether I like it or not. That first one, Black Mountain uh, Dragon, uh, with a kobold, not much going on, it's very short, and I didn't think it was very memorable. This one, Geshmalig's Tomb, is uh, written by the arranger, Christian Eichhorn, uh, and it is incredibly long, almost too long, because there's a lot of backstory right here, these first, like, page and a half is all backstory. It's good stuff, but it's it is quite long for a mini dungeon. Um, it's fantastic, though. I really, really like uh, the story of this one, which is this barbarian, uh, I guess, pair of barbarians. Which it kind of it doesn't spell it out, but it kind of makes the fact that this guy um, basically had a rival that he was became best friends with, possibly lovers with. Although it, it does a good job of not necessarily spelling that out. Um, and he was killed, and then his best friend tried to bring him back to life, and then he died bringing him back to life. There's this whole, like, kind of almost Romeo and Juliet thing, fantasy version of these guys, like, killing each other and bringing themselves back to life. And then the one friend comes back as this basically just undead warlord who's super bent on just raising this army of undead. And he brings his buddy back to life, but his buddy's not quite remembering what's going on. So there's, there is a nice backstory there that does play into the final part of this adventure. But what I really like is it just offers... Uh, a nice scenario with a lot of cool things, a lot of good story beats too. There's uh, there's a pair of uh, like grave robbers basically that are just kind of friendly NPCs that can kind of help the players and just uh, you know offer. I, I just like when you insert like NPCs into an adventure basically, like give the player somebody to interact with rather than just killing things left and right. And those characters do a good job with that. Um, there are a lot of and what's interesting here is because this adventure is designed for. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to skip over that in some of these trying to cover all of this designed for level 10 so it is a this is a high high level uh relatively high level dungeon so they have to scale up you know instead of skeletons there's Uthgard skeletons which are just scaled up skeletons basically uh Sincer and melissa are the grave robbers here um and there's just some fun stuff going on i really liked the there's a vat at near the end um that really reminded me of uh in fallout 1 the original fallout in like 97 i think you discover it's the super mutant menace, and there's this villain, the master, who's making uh, people into super mutants by dipping them into this uh, vat. Uh, and it, it exactly reminded me of this scenario, where there's literally a vat at the end of the dungeon where this undead guy is just putting people into, and then they come out as just pure undead. Uh, which I, I love that as a hook. I think that's a cool thing to like, oh, we gotta stop this guy from raising this army of undead, and he's got this pool of uh, chemicals to do it with. Uh, you also meet, and there's a necromancer that you meet that can either work with you or against you that literally builds these giant skeletons called siege skeletons, which is fantastic. There's a good artwork. There it is. Which I believe one of the artists is credited as Christian Eichhorn, who uh, I think drew these pictures 
which uh, if you did, these are amazing. I love this art style uh, with the, like the shadowed lines and everything. And this depicts an actual like scene from the adventure very, very nicely, which is there's the chemical vat and there's one of the big siege skeletons like coming out. So uh, just really, really neat. And there's a really neat final scenario where you meet the best friend who's been uh, risen as an undead, but he's not evil. He doesn't really know what's going on. You have to do that classic thing of you have to explain to him, like, oh, you're dead now, and your buddy's kind of turned into this horrible person, and there's a nice little role-playing opportunity. So there's a really good mix of just different things happening here. Um, the primary villain has the Eye of Vecna, which is this cool, like, laser eye that you can uh, grab. I believe it, yeah, it's in the DMG. It says up here in the DM's note. And it's got a good mix of uh, custom monsters and items in it. Uh, to where there's a full page of monsters and NPCs. Yeah, the youth guard skeletons, just CR1 skeletons, basically. Um, there's the two undead barbarians, CR6 and CR8. Siege skeleton, just a gigantic skeleton with a war, you know, the siege hammer. Uh, and look at the items. There's a full two-page spread of just the custom magic items, which is also fantastic. So this one is a way, way bigger than I expected. It is by far the biggest, most in-depth adventure, which, again, it is... I, I assume this was Icorn's, um, you know project his baby was to put all these together since he was the arranger um and this is obviously kind of the marquee adventure and it's a good one i think it is absolutely a fantastic uh adventure and I, i'm not quite like ranking them all and seeing which one's my favorite or not but this is definitely up there with one of my favorites and one of the best ones and and it has the theme really well it doesn't involve giants but it does involve the uthgart tribes which are mentioned throughout um the different sections of that open world chapter and they're, they're very prevalent in those kind of northern areas, and this is um, very much a thing like you're supposed to play on the fact that there's this undead kind of army like menacing people. So just makes for a really good uh, like side quest jaunt, I think. Uh, very satisfying. You can see here are the maps, which, you know, fortunately the maps are what they are, but at least some of them involve uh, multiple pages and, and are pretty big. And, I mean, it's, again, it's exciting enough where I'm like, okay, I, I could do this, but I'd have to redo all these maps. <laughs> I just can't use these maps as is. Uh, Grotto of the Death Giant by Eddie Joffrey. I wonder if that's the way to spell Joffrey. Uh, this one... Which one is this? God, there's so many. Grotto of the... Oh, this is the lower level one. Okay, this is the fourth level. Um, this one is not... I didn't think was very memorable at all. And it, again, it's a lower level dungeon. And it's basically just a cave full of ogres. And then at the end, you find a furbolg who is worshipping a a dark giant god, which I had to look this up on Google to see if this was a real thing, and I guess it is. Karantar, which is a lesser known god of Greyhawk, uh, but is a giant god of, like, decay and death. Uh, just kind of your classic, like, evil cult. You're trying to start this evil cult. Uh, and there's just a bunch of ogres, and then the only interesting thing here, yeah, goblins, uh, is that the end boss, you actually fight like the avatar of Karantar, which is a, let's see, you fight Gonf the Cleric. Uh, I think it's at the end here. Yeah, the Avatar of Karantar, which is a undead Fomorian, which I think are the, the ant people. Uh, has the stats of an ogre zombie with some increased stats on and some magma methods. So there's a, there's a cool part where they actually have to go down and fight the, like, god part of it. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but otherwise, it's not terribly interesting. I feel like that connection to the Dark God is very tenuous to like giant lore, but also you know, you could slot this into anywhere and just have it be... There's a weird part at the beginning where you meet some hunters that kind of fleshes out like the fact that one of them is like maybe a disciple of this Dark God, so I think there could be more to make... There could have been more done to make this a bigger deal rather than you just find this like very localized like um, death cult thing, which I do like that a lot of these adventure... Well, all of the adventure has... They have adventure hooks. Um, where are they at? There we go. So all of them are organized very well because they have the advent they have the thing at the beginning which tells you, okay, how many, what's the level range. Adventure background, which is just a quick like couple paragraphs so the DM knows exactly what's going on. And then adventure hooks, which is specifically how to get the players interested in this side quest. And some of them are just as simple as well. They just stumble across the entrance to this tomb. Do you want to go inside? Which, you know, a lot of parties will say like, yeah, okay, that works. But some of them are do offer some better stories. Uh, and this one does have some good ones. You're lo hired by a local herbalist looking for a certain mushroom that grow in the area. It just leads you to the cave and that kind of thing. So there's a caravan traveling that attacked by goblins and ogres and you have to follow them. Th and that's fine. I, I do like that those are there and those bits are there. This one does have some better story hooks than others. Uh, in order to, like, how do you get the players to these dungeons, basically? 
And there is your maps. Saving Barbadoo's Mine. I loved this adventure by Matt Butler with an average party level of 9. Uh, this one is fantastic because it starts off really well. You basically see what you think is like uh, fire on a mountain. And you examine it and you realize it is a cloud giant's house on fire because it's being attacked by a fire giant. And the opening introduction, which it has a little funny part of saving Private Duba, um, is the the cloud giant has been captured and his son by the fire giant. And then he, the fire giant puts his wyvern into the house to just terrorize the house, I guess, attack it burn it to the ground and the child this cloud giant child is inside so you have to immediately bust in and do the heroics of defeating this uh wyvern and saving this which you know it's a 10 foot tall because it's a giant child but that's a great hook that really uh, puts the heroes immediately into like hero mode and uh you know gives them an immediate danger that they can solve and then the, obviously the child's like oh go save my papa here's the mine and all this so that is by far the best uh hook slash introduction of any of these dungeons uh it, well yeah, dungeons, I guess. That one almost seems like an adventure in itself. Um, and then that leads them to this uh, nearby mine uh, full of bright steel, which I don't know if that's a thing or if they invented this for this dungeon. Um, and this mine is full of monsters, like to video game level proportions. It's almost insane. It is, it's is. it got uh, like a bunch of Zorn, um, Grey Oozes, Black Puddings, and uh, Stalac, uh, no, the the Ropers that drop down, and then, no, the uh, Piercers, the Piercers that drop down, and then there's one Roper um, further along. And this is like a one-room dungeon. It's very small. Let's go down to the, look at that. This is the, most of these that you saw have multiple, you know, page-sized dungeon, you know, parts that fit together to make the whole dungeon. This is literally just this one. And there's just a shit ton of monsters like every step of the way. It's it's pretty bananas. So, but I like the ending. There's a bunch of traps at the end that sets off, and literally the fire giant's like holding the cloud giant, uh, his face to like the fire, and trying to torture him to get control of this mine because there's this magic necklace that controls the Zorn. There's some really cool stuff going on here that I liked. It's a good mixture of traps and then story beats because of the you know you're saving the giant child, talking to him, and then rescuing the the father. He's very grateful. It uses the giants very well, obviously, because it's it uses them directly. Um, your players definitely ha want to have, you know, you want them to like more action-packed stuff in here because there's really, you know, once you save the child, it's it, there's no real role-playing up until that final beat. It's just fucking, you're fighting, like, room to room to room, a bunch of shit. So, if you like that, like, my players would, I think, like that a lot. Uh, this seems like a very, very appealing adventure and one that really uses giants in a really fun way and lets the players, like, feel like heroics rather than just, like, you know, tomb raiding, which is what a lot of these are. So I really, really like this one. This is probably one of my favorites of the bunch. I have to get a drink of water because this is going to be a long video, and I record all of these live. So not live, but in one take, I guess I should say. Um, but I love that one. Stone Giants Lost Rock by Micah Watt. This is the other low-level one for level 3. And this one, is, it does have giants in it. There's a little stone giant that's just kind of hanging out that you get the quest from, which is to retrieve this... MacGuffin, basically, just an item that's important to his people, um, which is fine. That's a good way of, of tying it into the Storm Giant's Thunder, uh, Storm King's Thunder. Uh, the actual adventure, however, is actually more about dwarves. Uh, you go into a nearby clan of dwarves who have worked out this deal with a Zorn, uh, and this Zorn, they have to pay the Zorn to... I forget what the details are, but it's, it's not terribly interesting honestly except for the fact that there's a it's just kind of this underground adventure here but the, it's the most interesting part of this one is the end after you actually fight the zorn through this like tunnel network and then you come like you're coming back out and then it turns out that the the dwarf clan leader's eldest daughter actually set the whole thing up. Like, she made the deal with the Zorn and all this to basically undermine his authority and try to take over the clan, which that's a cool scene and a nice bit of betrayal, especially if you do a good job of foreshadowing her early on when you first get the quest. And it takes place, I believe, on, like, a bridge. Uh, spring their trap, face the characters across the chasm, blocking the intact bridge, which is very nice. Um, and also one thing I haven't mentioned is a lot of these, I don't think all of them, but most of the 
uh, adventures do mention, have difficulty adjustments, so if your party is stronger or weaker than the average party level, then you can add or take away things, which is always a nice way of scaling uh, the different combat encounters. But uh, I really like that moment. Otherwise, I feel like this one would be kind of, not necessarily bad, but just kind of a straightforward, you know, dungeon crawl as far as they go. But I do think that ending betrayal adds a nice um, hook, uh, twist to things and makes it really... Uh, interesting, because the players don't expect to have to do that after, you know, you fight the Zorn, you just come back out, basically. Um, but otherwise, this one is one of the few that doesn't include any kind of custom uh, items or NPCs in it, interestingly enough. You can see it just goes right to the next adventure. The Barovian Book of the Dead is by Andrew Demps for uh, Party Level 9. Is very cool, but doesn't seem to have anything to do with Storm King's Thunder. It's one of the ones whose theme is very questionable. Um, and even by the title, Barovian Book of the Dead, you're thinking, oh, it's, it's more like Curse of Strahd, and you'd be right, because, oops, uh, because it even says that the book belonged to Strahd, and just, he kind of, like, teleported it to, uh, this chapel here. That's not to say I don't actually like this adventure, I think it's really cool, it's just that it feels very, very weird to put that into Storm King's Thunder. Um, but you... You find this chapel, which there's one character that accompanies you, an archaeologist, and treasure hunter, Yanar June. And a lot of these adventures have, like, a single NPC as their hook to basically get your players there. But he actually serves a different purpose, and that is, well, I'll tell you in a second. So you find this chapel, you find a hidden lever um, beneath the chapel that leads to this evil book of the dead. And as soon as you touch this book, it starts doing damage every turn to you. Not a lot, but it does do damage every turn. And then it spawns a horde of undead in a, like, mile radius or something insane that immediately converge on the book, and their goal is to just kill everyone and, and take the book. So what essentially is it does is it creates a, like, Night of the Living Dead or basically any zombie apocalypse scenario in that it just has... It's, it's that classic moment of the party is inside this building and they have to quickly, like, fortify everything and then there's just fucking skeleton, you know, I mean... Zombie applies with zombies. In this case, it's skeletons. It should be zombies, really. But it's skeletons here. They say 29 zombies uh, reach the chapel and begin attacking the vines over the window openings, trying to force the door open to gain access to the book, uh, which is a cool-sounding scenario. It seems like very challenging to run for a DM, and I know that there has been adventures. Uh, there was that one that I forget what the name was that did something similar with the, kind of every night that all the undead rose and attacked... Uh, the players, and they had a bunch of extensive rules um, about that scenario. And this one doesn't have that, so just kind of like good luck with that. But it even has some additional like adds to that, which is there's mummies in the lower level of the chapter that rise up and attack. Uh, and then, well, I guess the one giant connection is that at the end, the a pair of giant skeletons, skeletons of giants, uh, kind of remind me of the siege giants from the Greshromox tomb one. Uh, attack as the finale, and they're like ripping open the the cathedral to get inside, which is, it's really cool. I like this scenario a lot. There's, again, it seems difficult to run, especially in something like Roll20, where you're literally using the battlefield to have like all these hordes of skeletons coming at you. Um, and it doesn't offer really any hints about how to run it, but I think it's a neat, uh, it's neat and a lot different to just have basically like a Left 4 Dead style survival scenario here. Um, Although the actual connections to Storm King's Thunder are kind of tenuous at best. Uh, there's the actual chapel, which, I mean, that's, yeah, by far the smallest, one of the smaller dungeons here, but it's literally just a, like, you sit tight while you're besieged by undead. The Great Worm Caverns by Christopher Waltz uh, for level 10, which seems like that's a lot higher level than what Great Worm Caverns is in Storm King's Thunder. So obviously that that is a dungeon in Storm King's Thunder. It's where one of the giant relics takes place, and what this does is just expand and make it a lot bigger. Now, I'm not sure how the original Great Worm... Ca I actually played Storm King's Thunder, if you watch you know, this channel and keep up with our D&D adventures, um, but I did not DM it, so I'm not sure what the original looks like, and ours might have been modified quite a bit. I'd have to talk to Chris about that, but our DM for Storm King's Thunder. So, I can't quite compare them, but this one is definitely way more of an actual dungeon crawl than what I think the original one is. It's still, this one still has the quadl in it that kind of gives you the quest of, like, cleansing this cave. But the cave includes, basically, the barbarians are gone, are out, and uh, it's full of undead, uh, including a zombie polar bear, which is kind of hilarious. Um, 
It's got a very, uh, there's a lot of environmental traps, which I like. Uh, a lot of them don't really drive home that frozen north theme, but this one does it quite well because there's like a, a bridge with howling winds threatening to knock you over and all this, which is nice. Um, yeah, they talk to Quaddle, the, the Quaddle, Corgander, who kind of gives them the quest to basically take out this white dragon as well as this demon that has infested the area. So it's a bit of a twofer here. Um, it's a fairly straightforward dungeon crawl after that with just a lot going on here. But what I think is the most memorable part here, or at least what I can appreciate the most from a DM's perspective, is that the white dragon, Winterhorn, is given a full, almost a full entire page devoted to just, ta it's over half a page of just tactics, how to run Winterhorn as a combatant, which is great, because I am definitely a DM who has been guilty of not using monsters and NPCs to their full maximum potential and a lot of that is just you know you got a lot of going on with the story you're trying to balance things out by the time combat starts you're like okay let me just try and get in here and open this page up and just you know do the multi-attack and whatever and occasionally try to get just stand there and get a spell off or whatever this one literally says and there's a thing that tries to say uh he, he makes use of his incredible mobility always moving around the cavern and forcing the characters to fight in unfavorable terrain if you employ a stand and deliver tactic with winterhorn you and your players will be disappointed in this dragon's capabilities basically i feel i feel called out you know it's that meme where it's like i feel attacked um because i would be totally guilty of that i would not be using the dragon to its full round i just stand there and use my breath attack and then swipe people but this one says like look no you have to use his layer actions fly him around use his breath like use him to his utmost capability so that really made me raised my eyebrows in a good way and I said okay this this one really cares about their boss fight which is nice so there's a lot you know unlike the black dragon battle from earlier this one really seems to care about its dragon battle um, otherwise it's not terribly memorable it just does but it's nice the way it just kind of directly replaces an area from that campaign with just a bigger meteor dungeon crawl although one that is much higher level because they're fighting a fucking dragon at the end but I did like how much attention is paid to this dragons tactics and you get a fuck ton of rewards you get a full dragons uh reward from that because you are fighting an adult white dragon straight up so uh could be definitely uh, pretty fun if your players are a little higher level and wanna you don't have enough dragons there to fight oops click off that uh and a zombie polar bear that's always a funny thing to have there's the maps you can see there's the cool bridge over the water. So, I mean, some of these have, like, just the barest amount of detail, but still, like, God, it would have been so cool just to have just a little bit of an actual map to use in any of these. Uh, the Tomb of Mild Discomfort by Jason Baco Bacos for level 6 is a... like, a playful, tongue-in-cheek mockery of the Tomb of Horrors, or the modernized the Tomb of Annihilation, not the campaign, but the actual Tomb of Annihilation at the end. And it is literally said it was built by a Serac, um, but it's done as like a joke almost. Like it, <laughs> it's the title does mean like things, you know. The Tomb of Annihilation slash Horrors is, is a death trap dungeon designed to kill the players left and right. It's got horrible things happening in there, bad situations. And this one is kind of a just a almost a satirization of that. It's like the traps just don't do much they're they just kind of teleport you out of the dungeon maybe or you fall but you only fall like 10 feet so none of them does much damage and it's level six so it's kind of a lower level thing <laughs> my favorite part is there's a skull that if you touch animates and it's this wizard who's just super fucking annoying and it just the skull follows you around and just endlessly ber and asks you questions and it's just really nosy and annoying and awful and i thought that was a really funny thing although it might be really difficult to role play from a dm standpoint but it's kind of a funny way of driving home the fact that this is just a lot of annoying, silly things that happens. Uh, one of them is your you, one of the puzzles you have to pull all these levers down, and if you don't quite do them at the same time, then they slowly go up, and there's no way you can prevent them from just standing there and watching them like agonizingly move up until they're back up again. So just the the, the entire thing there is the trap just takes a while to reset, doesn't actually do anything else. So that kind of stuff's funny, but I feel like you definitely have to have the right group for it and the right, like, you know, theme for your campaign, if you're doing a very serious campaign, I don't think it would work well, unless, maybe that's the point, like, maybe your players just got out of this awful, like, horrendous death trap dungeon, you just want to throw this one at them, and then they decide, oh, ho, that's, that's a funny scenario. So I feel like certain groups could find this very funny and nice, and others will just kind of balk at how really almost overly silly and dumb it is. Um, and it's obviously not nearly the size of the Tomb of Horrors. It's a miniature version. It pulls in like maybe like three or four key scenes from uh, those dungeons and just uses those 
Uh, but it's, it's it's a funny idea. I just think your mileage may very well vary. I don't think I... Well, I wouldn't use it because I'm obviously using the, the Tomb of Annihilation campaign, so I don't think it would fit at all if you're actually using the, that adventure because then they will... You, I mean, some of these scenes are basically the exact same, like the false entrance and those kind of things, so you don't want to be doing that. But it could work. The Vault of the Undying by David Floor for level 7 through 8 is probably the most straightforward just Tomb Raider mission in here. There's very, very little actual story. There's pretty much no adventure background. You are just raiding this tomb that has been sealed to hold a undead wizard, which an undead wizard is usually a lich, but this one is, you know, because it's whatever level it is, it's the actual wizard is like CR7, I think, or something. It is extremely trap-heavy, uh, to where there's like double doors at the beginning that do all kinds of traps. There, I mean, it does do some nice stuff with the traps. There's a scenario where you walk in and you all have to roll a save or be blinded, but then if you open one of the treasure chests that's sitting there and you're not blinded, then you take a bunch of damage. So you actually kind of do want to be blinded while you're in that area, which is a neat twist. And then each of those chests contains a key, but only like one of the key is the real is the real key that opens the door to the boss room. And you have to roll, you know, a very high intelligence check to be able to tell which one is the right one. If you insert the wrong one, then a big trap goes off. So it's definitely a death trap dungeon. Um, the actual final boss fight is fine. It's kind of straightforward with the this, you know, mini lich guy, I guess. But the coolest thing, and again, this is what the other one did with a kind of betrayal twist. This one didn't have the story moment, but it has a there's a scorpion construct, uh, yeah, right here in the middle as you walk in and it's there like in the middle reminding you all of like what it looks like and it's kind of badass looking this giant giant scorpion robot thing that just kind of stands there and you can detect magic and tell that it's somewhat magical my only fear would be if the players start just kind of wailing on it um but once they defeat the final boss and walk out then that thing animates and it is a harder cr level than the actual final boss it's, final boss is cr6 and that thing is a cr9 that is a crazy big boss fight and pretty funny because it happens after the boss battle, so I think it could be a really intimidating scenario and a really good rate of teasing it because it's in that main room and I think eventually your players just kind of ignore it until they come out after they think they've won and then this giant scorpion animates and attacks them, so that's kind of neat. But otherwise, it's, it's a very low, low story um, tomb, but that means it's also, I think, easy to run on a DM scale. You know, if you've got a lot of story stuff happening, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you just want to throw in something that doesn't have a lot of story. You just want to be like, yeah, I just want to have this tomb full of traps and bad guys, and that's fine. Like, I think that could totally work. So this is definitely one of the good ones, I think, in that way. Um, the final one is the Ankazi's Crypt, another crypt, which, you know, the title of the thing is Tombs and Crypts of the North, so you're going to see a lot of, a lot of crypts. This one... It's full of demons, though, which is odd to where I think it would fit almost better with Out of the Abyss than Storm King's Thunder, um, designed by Darren Parmenter for level uh, 10, 10th level character. So you can see a lot of these I've mentioned are that, like, 8, 9, and 10 range. So it's a bit of overlapping if you wanted to do multiple ones. It's I guess you could expand that one time frame of the character's career. But they, uh, and they're accompanied by a friendly NPC, which, again, that's how a lot of these story hooks work. Mainly he's there because he can read Abyssal, I believe. He's more, you know, involved in demons, which, to me, if your characters don't have anything to do with demons, and your adventure doesn't have anything to do with demons, this is an odd one to insert, so it's a little, I think, trickier. But if you do have those things, then this is a good add, because it's it does a good job of telling a story. The first half of this crypt, like the upper half, has a lot of environmental storytelling, where it's got, like, murals depicting um, different scenes, and there's this ritual... Uh, that the players have to recite as they go through each one, written in, you know, abyssal on each thing, which I think that's really nice and tells the story about how this supposedly adventurer defeated the Demogorgon, which it turns out he actually wasn't able to defeat the Demogorgon. He turned into a demon himself. And you discover that in the lower half uh, that this person has been um, essentially killing people for Demogorgon. He's got a sacrificial dagger. Uh, there's this mechanic where he can't quite leave the area because of this pain that hits him. Um, there are like portals to hell, which is kind of, there's a name, Orpheon Yakanzi. Um, there are portals to hell in different rooms that spew out like fire and acid. Uh, so it does, it has the demon theme very well, but that's not the theme of like any other adventure in, or any other dungeon in this compilation. So that was the only thing that weirded me out. Um, otherwise, I think it's, it's a solid dungeon crawl. 
if you are interested in that, you know, very heavy demon thing where everything's about hunting demons and this demon's backstory and all that, it just doesn't seem like it has anything to do with Storm King's Thunder other than it, it is a crypt, I suppose. Uh, and I believe... Oh, there's a treasure golem. That's a pretty neat thing. A CR-10, which I guess it is level 10, isn't it? Yeah, and this large demon is a CR-12. Wow, you're getting up there. Uh, this one does have a whole host of magic items to use, though, which is quite nice. And I think that brings it to the end of my analysis of every one of these 10 dungeons, which is a lot. Like, there's a lot here. And you can see by my review of each one, most of them are pretty good. You know, they might not all have a good mix of, you know, story and role-playing and traps and puzzles and, and monsters and all that. They might, you know, very few of them have all of that in one, but between all of them, you've got a lot of that to where you can kind of pick and choose depending on what you are looking for and what your group is looking for. If you're looking for something that's more story-heavy or more just a trap-laden puzzle or maybe something that's just light-hearted and goofy, like, you have all of those available. Um, some of them don't quite fit that theme of being able to put into Storm King's Thunder quite as easily, I think. But also with these packs, I don't think you need to limit yourself to just using these in Storm King's Thunder at all. Like, a lot of these could be slotted anywhere. Um, let's go over my pros and cons for Storm King's Barrows, Tombs, and Crypts of the North. Uh, first pro is that includes 10 dungeons with a huge amount of content, mostly for Tier 2 parties, and kind of just what I mentioned, that they've got a nice uh, variety. Each dungeon has multiple adventure hooks and flexible level scaling for weaker or stronger parties. I do like that is included. Like, you've got some of those hooks work much better than others in terms of getting how the party, like, learns about this location or why they care. Uh, and a lot of them, some of the, you know, but there are, like, two or three hooks for each one. Some of them are as simple as they just stumble across the door to this place, which, you know, that can be fine. Uh, pro, each of the contributing authors gets a nice paragraph blurb at the beginning. I do really like that. If I really particularly like one of these adventures, I can see the name and go back up to the beginning and actually see the blurb rather than me having to, like, Google search and look on the DMs Guild which I would do, you know, later, but at least let me read about kind of what else that person has done, and maybe I would be interested in uh, exploring more of that work. Uh, in pro, some of the dungeons offer some really interesting and memorable moments and story beats, the ones I mentioned, uh, the undead barbarian raising the army for his uh, lost love, or best friend, I guess, whichever, uh, and the one rescuing a cloud giant child from a fire giant's pet wyvern as the, uh, as the introduction to that one uh, mine crawl adventure was uh, very cool and memorable so there's some definitely neat scenarios here cons the maps oh the maps all of the maps are black and white graph paper design with no details that adventure league style <laughs> now which wizards even use this style for dragon heist and i didn't like it then i don't like it here i don't like ever to see these maps i, I mean they serve the minimum purpose, which is for you to visualize the actual, like, physical layout of the dungeon. You need that at the very minimum. But I need more than just this. I really, really hope if you are designing specifically a dungeon, you know, if it's, if it's a total adventure and you don't have any maps or anything, then that's a bummer. But at least you've got, you know, an adventure there. But if it's just a dungeon and you've got this, then that's at least the minimum, but you don't have an actual map I can use on, you know, a table as a battle map, or for me, like in Roll20, I would have to make that completely myself, and that's a lot more work, which is a major bummer and a major con every time for me on this kind of map design. Uh, the other con I put is that a few of the ventures don't fit as well with the theme of Giants or, like, the Frozen North, uh, and the notable ones that I called out, the Black Dragon Mountain Lair, the Demon Tomb, and the uh, Book of the Dead one. Um, you know, the latter two seem to fit more into, like, Out of the Abyss and Curse of Strahd, respectively, which doesn't necessarily make them bad adventures, it just doesn't quite seem to fit in with the theme that all the rest of the adventures are tied together with and what this entire compilation does, so it just kind of seems like odd additions in here. But, anyway, final verdict. Even if you are not running Storm King's Thunder... Storm King's Barrows provides an excellent assortment of mini dungeons with some very memorable tomb raiding scenarios and battles. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com, and you can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. Follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you. See you next time.